Howdy, I'm Guinness Walker, creator of a Grand Theft Auto lore series here on YouTube, Grand Theft Auto Biographies. Because of that series, I have been asked quite often which Grand Theft Auto is my favorite. So today, I'm going to hop on that trend that probably died ages ago and make a tier list for the entire franchise. Now the way I see it, the most efficient way to do this while preserving some of the mystery is to go in the order that the games were released, starting all the way back in December of 1997 when Baby Guinness would have only been like one with the release of the game that started it all, Grand Theft Auto, for MS-DOS, Windows, and PlayStation 1. Now what I'm about to say about GTA 1 applies more broadly to GTA 2 and the expansion packs for 1, GTA London 1969, and 1961. Now I am by no means a stranger to playing very old games, at least by today's standards. I've played janky and arguably broken grindfests like the original Earthbound on NES, or the original Fallout, also from around the time that Grand Theft Auto 1 came out. I like old games, okay? And I am not a graphics snob by any means, at least I certainly don't think of myself as one. That being said though, I am a snob for manageable controls, and no matter how many times I've tried to play GTA 1, or 2 for that matter, it always feels like a clunky mess that I just can't really enjoy. Granted, this was literally the first game in this series and they were still finding their footing, but there's just something about the tank controls on foot that I find completely intolerable. It certainly doesn't help that every time I've tried to play GTA 1 or 2, usually on PC, it's had awful screen tearing and though I could probably fix at least this problem by emulating the PS1 versions, from what I've seen, those are even more pixelated and are just unappealing graphically, so maybe I am a graphics snob after all. But you know, I've never convinced myself to take that route. Long story short, I've never spent more than an hour or two with either GTA 1 or 2, and I've never even tried to get the GTA 1 London packs working, so my opinions on them should be taken with massive pillars of salt. Now I have seen plenty of footage and reviews of the classic GTAs, so to speak, over the years, and I've seen the GTA 2 movie plenty of times, so I'm not completely unfamiliar. In fact, I'm remembering that I actually did have a copy of GTA 2 for PS1 back in the day, that I would have played on my PS2, but it wouldn't have been my introduction to the series, so even back then, going from the 3D worlds of GTA Vice City and San Andreas to GTA 2's top-down arcade-style gameplay was something I just really couldn't do. So with all of that being said, I'm going to place the original Grand Theft Auto in D tier, which is simply the lowest tier on the list that I used. I wouldn't say it's a bad game at all, and its impact on the gaming industry cannot be understated, but playing it today is just not all that much fun for me, and more importantly, there's no consistent and comfortable way to play it on PC, and trust me, I've tried DOS emulators and the versions that Rockstar themselves released years ago. Both seem to suck. My only hope now is to maybe try a PS1 emulator because part of me does feel like eventually I owe it to this franchise to really see how it all got started. Now I've heard mostly bad things, at least in terms of gameplay, about the London packs. In terms of their aesthetic, they're quite charming, being the only GTA game set in a real-world city, and the only ones ever set outside of America, which makes for some pretty funny references since the developers themselves were originally Scottish. But like I said, I've heard that the actual gameplay of GTA London leaves something to be desired, and it's just more GTA 1 but with even harder bullshit. So I'm going to place both 1969 and 1961 in D tier alongside the original release. As for GTA 2 though... Now unlike GTA 1, I have played more than a half an hour of this game, and I played it very briefly back when I was a kid. The GTA 2 movie is probably what I remember most about it though, since I was never really good enough to make any significant progress in it. However, even I, who is not a big fan of the 2D era games, recognizes that GTA 2 is a cut above the first game, and it makes a number of welcome improvements to the gameplay that would eventually cross over into the 3D era with the next game. Because of this, I'm placing GTA 2 in C tier, just above the first game and its expansion packs. But now, as we leave the 2D era, we come to a game that changed the very face of gaming and spawned a new age of cultural panic about these dreaded video games. Though it wasn't my first game in the franchise, I did play it very early, and early enough for it to leave a substantial impression, and I am of course talking about Grand Theft Auto 3. Grand Theft Auto 3 defined a new genre for a new generation, the open world crime game allowing you to take control of various criminals and anti-heroes across franchises and get some good old-fashioned ultra-violent catharsis. 
Though GTA 1 and 2 had their fair share of controversies surrounding their release, when GTA 3 hit store shelves in October of 2001, prudish parents everywhere gathered together and barked, Oh! Won't somebody please think of the children? It was Mortal Kombat all over again. And then some. My first experience with GTA 3 would have been through the original trilogy box set for the PS2, which I believe came out sometime shortly after the release of San Andreas. I had started with Vice City, then played San Andreas, and when I got the trilogy for myself, I finally had the chance to try 3 for the first time. And I'll be honest, even back then, it was definitely never my favorite. I certainly never hated GTA 3, and I would have played it through to completion several times just because I loved Grand Theft Auto, but it was almost certainly the one that I played the least of the original trilogy. Having spent a considerable amount of time exploring Liberty City for my series GTA Geographies and playing the game as an adult though, I'd say that GTA 3 has grown on me quite a bit over the years. Though it's incredibly dated, janky, occasionally very frustrating and straight up unfair, it has a certain charm that I can't help but admire. For those reasons, I've decided to place GTA 3 in B tier, a great game, a game that is perhaps overshadowed by its more famous siblings, but whose impact on the industry was immense, and who paved the way for some of the best games of all time with its solid foundation for the 3D era. But with a game as big and successful as GTA 3, how do you follow it up? Well, by keeping just about everything the same graphically, but changing locations and improving the gameplay in what was my very first game of the series, and what is still one of my favorites of all time, Grand Theft Auto Vice City. Now as I said, and I've elaborated upon this a little bit more in my Game Vault series, Vice City was my first Grand Theft Auto game, all the way back in 2002. I would go to my best friend's house at the time and play this game and games like Driver 2 all day long, and eventually I would get access to my own PS2 from my dad where I would get the GTA Trilogy collection and finally get the chance to play through the games on my own, and oh boy did I have fun. This game introduced me to one of my favorite crime movie aesthetics, Florida in the 1980s, at least from Hollywood's perspective. It was because of Vice City that I watched movies like Scarface, which led me to things like The Godfather movies and Martin Scorsese's flicks like Casino. It was Vice City that truly created my love for this franchise and the genre of American-style crime dramas in general, so it should come as no surprise that for me, it's an easy S-tier. The game's map might feel a little bit small at times, a sentiment that I've learned is apparently not widely shared, but the story, the characters, the weapons, and the gameplay all sucked me in and kept me on the edge of my seat as a kid. As an adult, Playing Vice City feels like playing a Scarface meets Miami Vice video game, which, I mean, it practically is. We did eventually get a Scarface game, but I don't think we ever got a Miami Vice game, so this was about as close as you'd get. I mean, for fuck's sakes, Philip Michael Thomas is literally in the game. What more could you ask for in an 80s crime game set in the fictionalized, exaggerated version of Miami? This was also the first GTA game where the main character actually spoke and had a personality. Tommy Versetti is like a more level-headed Tony Montana, most of the time anyways, but without the crutch of being in love with his sister, thankfully. Ray Liotta's performance, along with almost every performance in the game from the star-studded cast, really brings you into the game's world and makes it feel more authentic. Authentically Rockstar, that is. Do I look like I can intimidate a jury? I couldn't intimidate a child, and believe me, I've tried. And with the success of two giant games under their belt, Rockstar would spend a little bit more time, two whole years this time, developing the third and arguably most famous Grand Theft Auto title to date, at least until GTA V, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. Now I definitely remember the release of GTA San Andreas. When it came out, it was subject to even more controversy than usual, and ended up getting rated adults only for a few months before Rockstar went in and removed the content that worried the prudes up at the ratings board. When we finally could buy the game, my friend and I played it all the time, and thanks to the two-player mode, we could even rampage simultaneously, something we wouldn't really be able to do again until the stories games on PSP or GTA Online, depending on how you see it. Like I said, I had the original trilogy box set, so I would have owned San Andreas around the same time that I got Vice City and 3 for myself but had played each of them earlier at my friend's house. San Andreas was one that I definitely spent a lot of time with, possibly more than the other two combined, though it's hard for me to say. If it was entirely up to Kid Guinness, this game would join Vice City at S tier because back then, I played through it from start to finish probably a dozen times or more. When I finally picked it up again proper for my 100% stream last year though, I found myself noticing a lot of things that I definitely didn't notice as a kid, which has since soured my opinion of the game ever so slightly, 
just enough to drop it down one tier to A tier. Still a fantastic game with the Boys in the Hood style gangster drama, but these days when I play it, I can't help but feel that San Andreas is too big and too wide for its own good. The best parts of this game, both story-wise and gameplay-wise, is the first section in Los Santos, and it only seems to go downhill from there. That's not to say that things you do in the countryside, San Fierro, the desert, or Las Venturas are bad, just comparatively not as good. The story also has a bigger helping of plot holes than I remember Vice City having, like the ambiguity of Ryder's reasons for betraying the Grove, or CJ's flip-flopping between relatable, charismatic gangbanger and complete psychopath who murders innocent people for kicks, just to name a few. Again, it's not that San Andreas is bad, not by any means. It's fantastic, and it still holds up today as a fun experience overall. But given its enormous legacy, it's kinda gotta deal with Ocarina of Time Syndrome. With the extra attention comes extra criticism, and as much as I love this game, I can't fairly place it at the top of the top, at least not on my list. One game whose position on this list probably won't come as a surprise, though, is the next game in the franchise, at least in terms of release order, technically. Grand Theft Auto Advance. <laughs> Now, unlike GTA 1 and 2, GTA Advance is still very easy to play without original hardware since it's a Game Boy Advance game. However, I hadn't even heard of this game, let alone played it, until I started the research for the first season of Grand Theft Auto Biographies. When I finally did play it, well, I was honestly kind of pleasantly surprised. Now, don't get me wrong, GTA Advance is certainly not one of the best games in the franchise, far from it. But based on its review performance and my own expectations, I ended up actually having a lot of fun with it, even if it could occasionally be indescribably frustrating just like the other 2D era GTA games. This game also reminds me that I definitely can enjoy top-down 2D style GTA games, and it reinforces the idea for me that the only thing that keeps me from truly enjoying the original games is the god-awful control scheme. So all things considered, GTA Advance gets a spot on C tier. Not a great game, but definitely not the worst in the series either. For what it is, the first GTA game that you could take with you on the go, it's pretty much exactly what you'd expect, and that is by no means a bad thing. But it's time we moved on to bigger and better games, at least for me, and to some of the franchise's other most neglected entries into the Grand Theft Auto canon, the Stories games, starting with the return to GTA 3's Liberty City in Grand Theft Auto Liberty City Stories. Now this is the first of two games that were originally released on Sony's first handheld system, the PlayStation Portable, but for me, I didn't even find out about this until many years later. See, when I was a kid, I actually did have a PSP, but I rarely used it, and I didn't really enjoy playing on it all that much, so instead, I would spend most of my time with my consoles at home. When I eventually spotted a new GTA game for PS2, I thought nothing of it and assumed they were just more PS2 GTA titles, learning many years later that the PS2 ports were exactly that ports of the original PlayStation Portable versions. Granted, the PS2 versions of the Stories games would go on to be the definitive versions, with additional missions, stability fixes, improved draw distances, and more. Liberty City Stories was Rockstar's first attempt at a full PS2-style game on a portable system, and looking at it now, especially in comparison to its younger brother, Vice City Stories, it really shows. LCS is a gritty, dirty, over-the-top mafia drama that follows the story of one of the high-ranking Leone members that we saw in GTA 3. Tony Cipriani, now with a new voice actor, as he sets up many of the events in 3 by helping Salvatore Leone and his crime family to become the most powerful Mafia outfit in the city. As a kid, I barely even noticed a lot of the little signs that this game was made on a budget and with stricter limitations, such as the rampant use of in-engine cutscenes, the relatively simplistic mission design, and the lack of several returning voice actors like for the main character, originally voiced by Michael Madsen, who ironically also voiced the protagonist in the Driver series, a direct competitor for GTA at the time. These days, playing through Liberty City stories, I definitely enjoy it thoroughly, mostly for the atmosphere of Liberty City, but that's something that you can get from GTA 3, too, so... Overall, a lot of the missions are a little bit too simple. There's no real antagonist, with it being a complete joke that Torini even has his own custom artwork, despite appearing in literally two missions. There are very few fully animated cutscenes in comparison to the other games, and there's a fair few number of missions that are either boring or complete bullshit. Because of this, I'm going to be placing Liberty City Stories in B-Tier. A good game, definitely worth playing if you're a fan of the older games, especially 3, but otherwise overshadowed by pretty much every other title of the 3D era, with the exception of GTA Advance. And although financially LCS did end up doing really well for the budget it was given, despite its severely limited scope, 
the next game in the franchise would also end up being the last 3D era game, and would be the most ambitious game ever released for Sony's PlayStation Portable, and ironically, would end up performing comparatively much worse. Grand Theft Auto Vice City Stories. Given that Vice City was my favorite game in the franchise even as a kid, when I saw that there was basically a prequel to it, it was like a dream come true for Kid Guinness. Even back then, I always actually paid attention to the story of the games and would dig into the interconnected world between the 3D era games. I would learn that much like Liberty City Stories before it, Vice City Stories would tell the story of some of the first game's side characters and set up many of the events that would eventually take place in that game. In this case, we take on the role of the brother of Philip Michael Thomas' character Lance from Vice City. Victor Vance. More than anything, Victor's role in this game serves to set up Lance's character arc in Vice City, but overall it does a fantastic job, at least in the story department. Now this game is infamously one of, if not the hardest, 3D GTA game ever made. I don't just mean from the 3D era, but excluding the ball-breaking difficulty of the original games, Vice City Stories is about as brutal as the franchise got, while simultaneously ironing out a lot of the mechanics that were introduced over the course of the 3D era. In this way, VCS is kind of like the best GTA of this era and the worst at the same time. When it was firing on all cylinders, it was one of the most interesting, fun, and engaging entries into the franchise, up to that point. But when it decides to rip the rug out from under you and just amp up the difficulty, it shows absolutely no mercy. For those who don't know, this game can occasionally toss missions at you that require basically either hawk-like reflexes or knowledge of what the mission will actually throw at you beforehand. And even then, sometimes that's not enough. For those who do know, I'll summarize my feelings towards this game's more bullshit missions with the title of just one mission, Light My Pyre. Now I definitely wouldn't have played this game legit as a kid, since it's so freaking punishing that it almost begs you to use cheats in some cases, even these days. I can beat it without cheats now, it's not like Dark Souls level difficulty or anything, but the spikes in difficulty are among some of the most brutal that I've ever seen in any game, relatively speaking making it an occasional chore to play, even though most of the time it's an utter blast. For all these reasons, I'm going to put VCS in A tier. If it weren't for the more bullshit missions, it could easily be S tier for me, with things like the Empire Building System, being able to buy back your guns after dying or being busted, and finally being able to swim in Vice City's shark-infested waters. But, because of its frustrating factor, it simply can't quite reach the very top of the list in a lot of ways. Though this really was the peak of the 3D era, and for a while the entire franchise even if most people thought of San Andreas as the gold standard. Following this game's release though, we would finally say goodbye once and for all to the 3D era continuity, as a new age dawned on the franchise with a new kind of game for Rockstar. A game that would not only alter the gaming landscape in significant ways, but become the most successful media product ever, until it was finally surpassed only by the next entry in the same franchise. That game was Grand Theft Auto 4. This video is brought to you by my wonderful supporters over on Patreon. By supporting the channel for less than $2 American a month, you can get early access to videos, the ability to download episodes, and nearly 100 original music tracks, many of which are extended versions of the tracks that are on streaming services. A very special thank you to my executive producer tier patrons, Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Ossie, Diecastinator, Chuck K 45 and Miles Garrett. All of you are amazing and your support is something I truly can't express my gratitude for fully. Thank you so much. Today's episode is sponsored in part by my executive producers Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Chuck K45, and Diecastinator. You can check out Ezra's YouTube channel, Scott Games 99 where they play games such as NHL and MLB, and story-based games like the Red Dead Redemption series, with plenty more story-based games to come soon. Mason Collins' podcast channel, We're About Everything, where they discuss, well, everything from zombie apocalypses to game remasters and more. Chuck K45's channel, who's working on setting up a channel all about buying farm equipment and fixing it up and then starting a new farm from scratch. And Diecastinator's channel, where they examine, review, and discuss all things diecast, from the history of the hobby to rare models, and much more with new videos basically every day, in addition to buying and selling and trading the diecast cars. All links in the description, and a very big thank you to all of my patrons. Your support is literally helping me to keep the lights on, so from the bottom of my little black heart, thank you all so very much. Support the channel by showing my executive producers some love, or sign up yourself today. And now, back to the video. Now, 
Vice City may have been my first entry into the series, and for a while was my favorite GTA game, but GTA 4 brought things to a whole new level for me. The year was 2008, and a naive 12-year-old Guinness was following every piece of information he could find on the upcoming GTA title. I watched all the trailers, saw the E3 reveal, everything, and boy was I hyped. In fact, after bugging my dad long enough, GTA 4 ended up being the first game that I ever pre-ordered, because I was just that excited. When it finally came out, I played it non-stop. To my still prepubescent mind, it was a complete mind-blower. The story was gritty and grounded in the real world more so than almost any other previous title. It was dark and realistic, while still retaining that trademark GTA sense of humor. It was new, improved, and to me, it looked so incredible graphically that I literally remember saying to myself something along the lines of, Games will never look better than this. How the times have changed. Much like each of the previous entries into the franchise, Grand Theft Auto 4 was heavily inspired by some pretty specific genres of criminal drama, in this case mostly Russian crime films like the critically acclaimed Brat, or Brother, and its sequel, the protagonist of which was the main inspiration behind the visual design and parts of the character of Nico Bellic. As a kid, this game was my introduction to the more realistic side of the world that Grand Theft Auto was always scratching the surface of. It offered a believable, often poignant portrayal of the American dream as viewed from the perspective of the working-class immigrant, and it spurred a more thorough interest in me for learning the history of real-life criminals and the historical circumstances which made them each relevant. Playing this game today as an adult, it hits home even harder than it ever did or even could when I was still a kid. It is an exceptionally different experience to see and play as these characters when they're adults that you have a hard time relating to, versus playing as an adult and knowing people in your own life that remind you of a Roman, or a little Jacob, or even a Nico, and understanding a little bit more of what leads them to make some of the choices that they do. Don't misunderstand, I think, I hope, that most of us can't truly relate to murdering our way through the Russian Mafia in New York City to become one of the most feared criminal contractors on the East Coast but a lot of us can relate to serving or knowing someone who served in the military and continuing to relive the trauma from those experiences to this day. Many of us can relate to trying to start our own business while barely squeezing by, hoping for a big break to one day make it big. Many of us can relate to wanting to be with someone and feeling guilt over making your baggage their baggage, and the sometimes tragic consequences that can come of that. Minus the mass murdering, the story and characters of GTA 4 are often very, very relatable, and even when they're not, they're always thoroughly entertaining. In terms of gameplay, GTA 4 was easily the most ambitious title in the series at the time of its release, a trend that Rockstar has continued to try to live up to ever since. The driving felt weighty and realistic to go along with the rest of the game, but still had enough depth to allow good players to learn the ins and outs of street racing in this new HD Liberty City. The gunplay was vastly improved over anything from the older games, with proper third-person over-the-shoulder aiming, a cover system, and a whole system for shooting NPCs in specific parts of their bodies to affect their performance, thanks to the magic of the new physics engine. In a lot of ways, GTA 4 feels completely different from anything in the 3D era, while still feeling plenty familiar. It built on many of the ideas established in the previous titles, and in some cases perfected them, while in some other cases it just kind of threw them right out the window such as the lack of any car customization and minimal customization for your appearance. There were also plenty of new things that Rockstar started to try with GTA 4, such as the slightly infamous friend system, Nico, it's Roman, let's go bowling! or the phone in general, which could now be fully interacted with to call your friends, start certain missions earlier than normal, or learn little bits of lore through secret conversations. GTA 4 really was the dawn of a new age for the Grand Theft Auto franchise, which is why it's fitting that it's the start of the so-called HD era, creating a wholly separate universe, allowing for this new direction to proceed unhindered. It should come as no surprise that for me, GTA 4 is an easy S tier, and would also likely be at the top of said tier. To this day, it remains either my first or second favorite GTA game, depending on how you count the game's DLCs, which I think of as being fully separate experiences. With that line of thinking, GTA 4 would be my second favorite in the series in terms of gameplay, and my first in terms of its story, as Nico is easily my favorite protagonist, if not of the whole franchise, certainly of the HD era. As I said earlier too, GTA 4 would go on to become the most successful media product basically ever, before it was overtaken by GTA 5. So how on earth do you follow up the insane success of a game like that as the cycle of game development begins to grow longer and longer? Well, by 2008 the answer was fairly universal, DLC. I give you... Grand Theft Auto, The Lost and the Damned. Now, 
oddly enough, despite the fact that I definitely remember seeing the advertisements for this add-on back in the day, I did not play this DLC. I didn't even own it until much later when they released the episodes from Liberty City Disc. I'm pretty sure the reason was, by then, I was starting to be expected to buy DLC with my own money, and would therefore only be able to get the new ones every now and again, and for whatever reason I either skipped or forgot about The Lost and the Damned in favor of the second DLC expansion, The Ballad of Gay Tony, which we'll get to soon. So my first full experience with The Lost and the Damned was when I played it to record the footage for Johnny Clevitz's episode in Season 1 of GTA Biographies. Unlike most of the other games when I played them for footage, I hadn't actually played and beaten Lost in the Damned before, so I decided I wouldn't just cheat my way through it as fast as possible, and played through it legit the first time to get the full experience. That being said though, I've only really played through it start to finish properly once, though I have spent considerable amounts of time in certain missions while filming for various episodes, so I'm more than familiar with it by this point. So what do I think about it? Well, The Lost in the Damned was Rockstar's first attempt at a whole DLC approach to new content and it also represented the second part of a three-part story between the main game and each of the DLCs, with all three of the protagonists meeting and interacting at various points across the narrative. In fact, Lost in the Dam's protagonist, Johnny Klebitz, had already been seen and sort of teased in the main game, though by the time the DLC actually released, his appearance would be slightly updated and his role in the story would be further elaborated upon. For me, the story of Johnny Klebitz, Billy Gray, and the Lost MC is a good one, don't get me wrong but it certainly isn't my favorite story, and it's not one that I've often returned to, even if there are plenty of things that I definitely love about it. I mean, I do enjoy the biker aesthetic, a lot of the music, but it's not necessarily one of my go-to things. I've always preferred things like Scarface or The Godfather to something like Sons of Anarchy, but that comparison is perhaps a bit unfair. So maybe it would be better to say that I prefer something like Breaking Bad or Fargo to Sons of Anarchy, but that doesn't mean that I don't still enjoy it. For these reasons, The Lost and the Damned is a solid B tier for me. Definitely a really good addition to the franchise, which introduced some memorable characters, tried some new things in terms of gameplay, and gave us a new aesthetic for the franchise unless you count the brief presence of the bikers in GTA Vice City. Lost and the Damned was good, but it was also Rockstar taking its first step with DLC, and in my opinion, they definitely did a much better job their second time around with 4's other expansion. But we have one more game which technically came up before it, before we get to that. Instead, next we'll look at the only portable entry into the franchise for the HD era, and one of the only times a Grand Theft Auto game not only came out on, but was specifically built for a Nintendo console, at least at first. Grand Theft Auto Chinatown Wars. <laughs> Much like The Lost and the Damned, this is another GTA that I didn't originally play when it came out. Unlike with the stories games though, I did know about this one, and I think I avoided it because all I really saw of it was the footage from the DS version, which to me, frankly, is kinda ugly. When I eventually played this game for the first time via PSP emulator for the episode on Huang Li, I actually ended up having a blast. Now, Chinatown Wars is technically set in the HD era, taking place in the same Liberty City scene in GTA 4 and The Lost in the Damned but with the graphical limitations of the DS and the PSP, some liberties are taken, pun intended. Parts of the city have been redesigned to function with the more grid-like and less freeform nature of the game, and overall it ends up being a near-perfect blend of all three eras of GTA, even if being a portable game it really can't reach the level of something like GTA 4. Chinatown Wars has the chaos and insanity of the 2D era, a bit of the more goofy aesthetic from the 3D era, and the more grounded realistic setting of the HD era. It takes place in 2009 after all of the events in the DLCs, and follows the story of a spoiled rich kid turned gangster, Huang Li, as he tries to uncover the truth behind his father's murder during the chaotic conflict to determine who would become the next head of the Liberty City's triads. The story this time around, especially in comparison to GTA 4, is a lot simpler and more comedic, with characters lacking any voice acting and only being characterized in short comic book style cutscenes during missions. For what it is though, Chinatown Wars is easily my favorite top-down GTA game, and is arguably the best portable experience the franchise ever delivered, depending on how you feel about the story's games, or exactly what it is that you're looking for in a portable GTA experience. For me, the stories games, especially Vice City stories, are PS2 games that were unfortunately designed first for the PSP, and thus are better suited to the full console experience of sitting in front of the TV with a controller and really experiencing them. Chinatown Wars, on the other hand, with its similarities to the more arcade-style 2D era games and its inclusion of the minigames like the drug dealing mechanic, make it a much better game to play on the go. To really experience LCS or VCS while playing on the go, you would need to use headphones. And though there is plenty to hear if you do use headphones for Chinatown Wars, you can also much more easily play the game without sound and still get basically the full experience, 
since there isn't even any spoken dialogue in the game, really. So I'm putting Chinatown Wars in B tier, though I would also probably put it at the top of B tier. I honestly think I enjoy Chinatown Wars more mechanically than The Lost and the Damned, and while it isn't quite good enough to reach the top tiers, it didn't really have to for what it is. I think it's an absolutely fantastic addition to the series that's definitely worth checking out. Before we would get to the next fully numbered entry into the franchise, though, we would get one more piece of DLC for GTA 4. A DLC that, for me, perfected the formula that was established in 4, and quite evidently served as a large part of the foundation for the next game. That DLC was, of course, Grand Theft Auto The Ballad of Gay Tony. So like I said, while I didn't play The Lost and the Damned when it first came out, The Ballad of Gay Tony I most certainly did. And hot damn, do I fucking love this. <music> Ballad of Gay Tony feels like the other half of the coin. If GTA 4 and, to a lesser extent, Lost in the Damned were the more dramatic and ultra-serious parts of the GTA franchise, Ballad of Gay Tony is the more bombastic, ridiculous, and arcade-style fun that the series had also become known for. Once again, we were still in the Liberty City map from GTA 4, but we got access to a bunch of new vehicles, the first real tank in the GTA 4 engine with the noose tank, a ton of cool new weapons, and the addition of parachutes, finally, as well as a few new vehicles to jump out of them with, like the Buzzard. For me, Ballad of Gay Tony is like the Bioshock 2 of the GTA series, certainly of the GTA 4 era of games and DLC. It nearly perfects the gameplay formulas established in 4 and Lost in the Damned, doubles down on the fun factor, and truly gave birth to the first real instance of a GTA Online type experience, even though multiplayer did exist in the original game as well as Lost in the Damned. When I played it as a kid, I had a ton of fun with the story, spent an absurd amount of time playing in online lobbies, and probably overall spent more time just exploring Liberty City as Louise than I did as Johnny and possibly even more than I did as Nico. As an adult, Ballad of Gay Tony might not have as hard-hitting of a story as Fours, but it's still one that keeps me entertained throughout with plenty of memorable additions to the character roster such as the eponymous Tony Prince, the hateable big brother to Brucey, Maury, or even our new protagonist, Louise, who is far more laid back and relaxed than either of the other two characters we've played as so far in HD Liberty City. The gameplay is, as I said, for me, almost as good as it gets, and definitely the peak of the GTA 4 era with things like the buzzard, auto shoddy, and sticky bombs all being fun and fantastic additions to the sandbox, on top of a plethora of other quality of life improvements to how the game feels and plays overall. I also just really dig the atmosphere of Ballad with its emphasis on nightclubs and the entertainment industry, and all of the perfect fodder for satire that that brings. There's also the new music, with one of my all-time favorite radio stations in the series, Vice City FM, debuting here, at least if I remember right, and the ability to move around the map with a lot more freedom thanks to the new vehicles and the ability to parachute out of helicopters. Because of all this, it really shouldn't be surprising that Ballad of Gay Tony lands squarely in S tier for me, probably just below our next entry in the franchise without giving away too much too early. I simply love the Ballad of Gay Tony, and my biggest complaints would probably be that being DLC, it's just a little bit too short. But after the release of this last piece of DLC for GTA 4, we would need to wait another three years before finally getting our hands on the next numbered entry in the series, which, just like the last one, would go on to shatter records across the board, and create a legacy of love and hate for the next decade to come. We have of course come to Grand Theft Auto V. So Grand Theft Auto V, the single most successful piece of media ever, as far as I'm aware, and even if it's debatable whether or not it truly takes that title, the fact that it's even up for debate shows just how wildly successful GTA V has been across the entire world. GTA V released 10 years ago, which is honestly insane, but at the time of writing this script, the 10 year anniversary is only months away, and as it draws closer, speculation of a full reveal for the next entry in the franchise climbs to an all-time high. When GTA V first came out, I was still a teenager, I would have been about 17, and it was the first time a GTA game came out that was actually kind of targeted at me since I was finally old enough to actually play them, at least where I lived. To say that I loved GTA V would be an understatement, but it would also not be giving the full picture since unlike GTA 4, the legacy of GTA 5 and its dreaded online component have continued to characterize my and many other people's thoughts about the game, perhaps unfairly, long after its initial release. 
Back when I first played this game, I had a fucking blast. I finally understood most of the jokes the first time playing instead of needing to come back later to understand what was actually going on. I thoroughly enjoyed the three protagonists mechanic and the performances from each of their voice actors, and I loved getting to see Los Santos in the HD era, looking even more clean and realistic than GTA 4 did, which, remember, I thought was the peak of gaming graphics at the time. That's how I felt back then. These days, it's no secret that I certainly prefer the aesthetics of GTA 4, and minus the improved character models, there are honestly times when I think that even 4 looks more realistic than 5 thanks to its art direction alone, whether or not that's necessarily a good thing. See, for all of the praise that GTA 5 has gotten and continues to get, among the GTA community there is a certain subset of people who, like me, love GTA 4 more than anything, and as a result, hate GTA 5 for being different in a lot of ways that they were not happy with. I do not fall into this camp, however. Now let me be clear, I still think GTA 4 is my favorite game in the franchise, at least story-wise, but I do not also hate GTA 5, not at all. In fact, I would place GTA 5 comfortably in S tier along with GTA 4, Ballad of Gay Tony, and Vice City, because I do think it's just that good. Are there things that I don't like about GTA 5's story mode? Sure. No game is perfect. But I think it does enough things right, and for me it makes so few missteps that it can only be an S tier, even if it would be below GTA 4 and maybe Ballad of Gay Tony in the long run. Honestly, I feel like GTA 5 is, in a lot of ways, the Ballad of Gay Tony but with a full-length story and more than one protagonist. It feels a lot closer in vibes to that than it does to GTA 4, and I really don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I love all three protagonists, at least love to watch and play as their characters. I do enjoy the story, though I wouldn't say I enjoy it as much as Vice City or even Ballad of Gay Tony, and I definitely enjoy the gameplay. If Ballad of Gay Tony was the perfect GTA 4 formula, 5 was reiterating upon that and for me improving it even further for the most part. If I took the damage physics, not the driving, but the actual damage physics from GTA 4 where cars could be crumpled into a thin paste, but give me the more responsive and intuitive driving feel of GTA 5, and I think I would have the ideal balance. The gunplay is much smoother than in previous games, the driving is responsive, and it's now a lot easier to both drive and shoot at the same time, and exploring the world has never been more engaging with dynamic wildlife, NPCs, and lots and lots of vehicles. I do understand the reasons a lot of GTA 4 fans don't like 5, but for me, I'm not really bothered by a lot of that stuff, and I can enjoy 5, at least the story mode, for what it is, and still consider it one of my favorite entries into the franchise, even if what it gave birth to has been the most insidious thing to happen to the series since it began. Speaking of which, what it gave birth to, Grand Theft Auto Online. Now I have a lot that I could say about GTA Online, and maybe I will one day, but for now, I'm going to keep this relatively brief and try to summarize my feelings for this game, live service, whatever you want to call it, over the last 10 years of its development history. When GTA Online first came out, it was novel. For a while, it was a lot like GTA 4's online mode with Battle Gay Tony. People would screw around, try to buy a few cars, hang out at the airport, and maybe you'd even meet some new people. Over time though, things changed. A lot and new people jumped on board with little to no history with the franchise, and thus, little to no expectations for what GTA Online might become based on what we've been getting up to that point. Well, over the last 10 years, GTA Online has become a toxic and often unplayable nightmare. At least, it most certainly can be. There is still plenty to enjoy here since, at its core, it's GTA 5, but I have to go out of my way to make GTA Online a tolerable experience, and it's only become easier to do that in the last year or so, with Rockstar finally giving us the ability to grind without interruption in private or friend-only lobbies. Combine the horrible balance of the economy, thanks to Rockstar's greediness towards shark cards, and the lack of any real anti-cheat on PC, resulting in it being practically unplayable on that platform, and what you get out of GTA Online is not fantastic. The way that I usually do and have for a while played GTA Online is to basically turn it into a single player grind fest. In the old days, I would accomplish this using the old Ethernet cord trick to simply empty the lobby and play solo, but these days, like I said, Rockstar finally lets you do this without needing to resort to crap like that. When played like this, I do definitely have fun in GTA Online sometimes, but it's hard for me to attribute most of that fun to GTA Online itself, when most of the time it's down to things that were already present in GTA 5 or simply the presence of good friends, who can make even the worst games thoroughly enjoyable, so... For all these reasons, I'm putting GTA Online in C tier. I originally did have it in B tier, but after considering just how much it disappoints for what it could be versus what it actually is, I had to downgrade it. Though it doesn't quite reach the bottom of the tier list, since for all its faults, I do still prefer to play it to GTA 1 or the London packs. 
And that's the list. I'm not going to bother figuring out what my exact order would be from worst to best. Maybe I'll save that for another video, but for now, this should give you an idea of exactly where I stand for each entry into the series. I hope you've enjoyed this video, which is part of a new, not really series of more one-off type content, but don't worry. The Game Vault and Criminal Histories are not cancelled, so stay tuned for more episodes coming in the future. And support me on Patreon if you want to see them even earlier. I'm also excited to announce the release of Grand Theft Auto Biography's soundtrack, Volume 1. Containing the over 50 original tracks written for Season 1, and all the covers of the various tracks done for the protagonist episodes. That may already be out by the time this video releases, as it's currently under review by my distributor, but if it isn't out yet, it should be coming out in the next month or so at the very latest, so look forward to that. I'm Guinness Walker, and thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Peace out. Mm -hmm.